Greetings. I am Brother Judah <clears throat> from the Congregation of Israel. And I would like to uh, greet you all who have taken the time out to uh, view one of our discussions. And today I want to talk about <clears throat> the housing problem. <clears throat> the housing problem, uh, which consists of homelessness, um, gentrification, some uh, no, understand it as gentrification. Uh, I want to look into this issue concerning housing, uh, the, especially homelessness. People can't find housing, uh, being put into shelters, and people working two, three jobs and still can't afford a home. And you have these different programs who, you know, they make an attempt to um, provide affordable housing. <clears throat> That's good. But what I would like to bring to the people's attention today is that the housing problem will not be settled in a society of capitalism. In capitalism, the housing problem will not be solved by affordable housing. And the only solution, and I'm not making this up today, this is what you find in history, the only solution is actually to abolish the capitalist mode of production. And uh, this is possible and actually it will happen. And for those of you who may be viewing for the first time, we also deal with the Bible. Now when I deal with the Bible and those of us who study with us, when we deal with the Bible, we're not calling you to religion. You know, sometimes when you mention the Bible, pe people think of um, religion, especially uh, Western theology. No, when we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about a road map that leads to the liberation of humanity, a road map that leads to justice and equity. And the Bible itself have, have a road map that leads to equity and justice. And it also teaches us that the ruling elite and all of the oppression in which they brought in the earth, in which they continue to uh, produce or bring in the earth, will be totally abolished. And the Bible gives us different signs of this. So when we're dealing with the Bible, I would like to add that we're also dealing with a political book. It's a political all through the, from the foundations of Genesis. Okay, the whole struggle is uh, of a man, a, a man named Abraham, who is to bring forth children who is supposed to spearhead this struggle for the liberation of humanity from all um, oppressive, oppressive regimes to destroy colonialism, to destroy imperialism. This is the job of Abraham's children. Now, we're going to read a little bit out of the Bible today, and um, I want to follow up through history. To, like I told you, I'm not coming up with this. This isn't, isn't a conspiracy theory. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. You just have to deal with plain math. Mathematics, meaning facts, the facts. The fact is that the housing problem will never be solved under capitalism. It will never be. In fact, most of the solutions to the poor under the capitalist system, if not all, simply is none other than ways in which the capitalists use their philanthropy or their donations to continue to fund the market. For example, if they want to help homeless people, they will write grants or allow people to have grants to uh, purchase food for homeless people but, or, or from, um, you know, people who need groceries. Well, you're still feeding the market. It still strengthens the market because you got to buy the food from the corporations who put us in this position anyway. And so let's look at this a little bit. Um, now, out of a book, I'm pretty sure the, you can find an updated edition, but this is the ninth edition of Social Problems. Um, and by no means is the uh, information in here uh, outdated. 
Now, uh, under chapter 6, subtitle Urban Problems in the United States, I want to begin there. Urban Problems in the United States. And it is under the uh, section Failed Housing Policies. Failed Housing Policies. Now, it teaches us in this book, Social Problems, it reads all the forces in the urban housing market that have led to the shrinking supply of affordable housing or affordable and low income housing have been met with or encouraged by failing government housing policies. So all of the forces and all of the activities of the people coming together um, in the urban housing market that have led to the shrinking supply of affordable and low income housing have been met with or encouraged by failing government housing. So all your corporations and the people come together, the small time capitalists, big time capitalists, they come together and they uh, have diminished or shrunk the supply of affordable housing. They are able to do this and it is encouraged according to social problems and it, um, the, the writers of this book is uh, Stanley Edson and Maxine B. Zen. Now, I want to focus on this a bit because it says this shrinking supply of affordable and low income housing have been met with or encouraged by failing government housing policies. Because we will often run to the government, we think the government uh, have our best interests, and that's not the case at all. I want to read to you an account from uh, Vladimir Lenin, uh, it's called The State and the Revolution, and he gives his views, found information while studying, specifically the writings of Karl Marx, and his own experiences, this is what he found concerning the government. Because again, uh, Zen and Edson in uh, Social Problems teaches us that the government actually encourage the uh, shrinking supply of affordable and low income housing. Why is this? Why would this happen? Why is it that for us to look for the government to help us and for us to look and think that, you know, passing a few laws that they're going to help the problem of those who are homeless and those who cannot find decent housing or shelter. This is the uh, purpose of the state. Notice this. Page 9, it reads, According to Marx, the state could neither have risen nor maintained itself had it been possible to reconcile classes. According to Marx, the state is an organ of class rule. Yes, the state is an organ of class rule. When we're talking about class, we're talking about rich class, poor class, and those of you who believe there's a such thing as a middle class, we're talking about classes in society. Now, the state, which goes under the term government or whatever, the state is an organ of class rule. Now, notice this an organ for the oppression of one class by another. The state is an organ of class rule, an organ for the oppression of one class by another. Make no mistakes about it. Uh, this is not conspiracy theory. The proof and the facts are lined up in history. And the truth of the matter is, the state is simply an organ used to oppress one class by another. And we know what class that is. The state is used by the rich class to oppress the poor class. Notice this. It is the creation of order, quote, order, which legalizes and perpetuates this oppression by moderating the conflict between the classes. 
Notice the state. The state is a tool used. It's an organ used. And what does the state do? The state legalizes and perpetuates the oppression by moderating the conflict between the classes. In other words, the class of the poor will remain in check, threatened by prison, threatened by guns, threatened by violence, if they ever decided to stand up for their rights. Well, you know what? We got to stand up for our rights. Jesus of Nazareth stood up for the rights of the people and it was the state who delivered him to the Roman Empire to be executed. Okay, now, if the state is a organ used to oppress one class by another class and the state is the organ in which it creates laws and legislation and legalizes and perpetuates this oppression. Well, that's why we have what we have in the United States today is the diminishing of affordable and low income housing. And this diminishing of low income and affordable housing have been encouraged by the failing government housing policies. Why do they fail? Because they're, they're not intended to succeed. All the forces of the urban housing market that have led to the shrinking, those forces are the forces of the ruling class, of the rich, who use the state to oppress the poor legally, legally, legal violence, social murder. And we must come to terms with this. We're not going to float off in the sky. That's not going to happen. The Bible don't teach anything like that. The Bible tells you to stand for righteousness and justice. And that's what has to be done. Men and women, is gonna, you're going to have to come to terms that you're not going to float off in the sky, but that you will have to stand for justice. You're going to have to stand for equity. And am I saying this or do the Bible that you have teach this? The Bible you hold teach it. Jesus of Nazareth stood for justice. The apostles stood for justice. The apostle Paul stood for justice. The prophet Isaiah, the prophet Amos, the prophet Ezekiel, the prophet Daniel, all of the prophets stood and fought for the right and equity of humanity. Many of us were not familiar with that because of the way in which theology have called you to view the Bible. The prophets wasn't thrown in jail for nothing. The prophets wasn't killed for nothing. You will find that the prophets were thrown in jail. The prophets were killed because they stood against the state. They stood against the government that was oppressing the poor and vulnerable people of the society. It was the state and it was the government that caused the deprivation and plunder of the people in the society as it is today. Now, I want to go further inside of this book the State and Revolution, page 13. And uh, page 13 teaches us uh, under the subtitle, The State, an Instrument for the Exploitation of the Oppressed Class. Section 3, The State, an Instrument for the Exploitation of the Oppressed Class. That's why they can go and pass a bill at night, don't really care, they hold people's lives in limbo while they go and say, well, we're going to hold off before we pass this bill. We're going to come back and decide later after Christmas break. And they drive off in their fancy cars and go to their they dinner parties and they go to their lavish homes and where they fare and live luxurious. And all in the meanwhile, the poor are burdened down with stress. The poor are burdened down with the... Um, concern of feeding themselves, housing themselves and their children, while the rich continues to use the exploit of state to oppress the masses of the people. 
Now, Mr. Lennon says, because the state arose from the need to hold class antagonisms in check, the state came into play because the rich and powerful men needed uh, a hierarchy to hold the masses in check, violently if needs be. But because it arose at the same time, in the midst of the conflict of these classes, it is a rule. <clears throat> the state of the most powerful economically dominant class which through the medium of the state becomes also the politically dominant class. So the most powerful economically class or the most powerful economically dominant class they also become the politically dominant class and thus acquires new means of holding down and exploiting the oppressed class. So this is not conspiracy theory. This is what's going on. What we have is the powerful economic, economically uh, so-called sound people. Those who are economically dominant they also become politically dominant and they are the rulers of the state and they will use the state to exploit and hold down the oppressed classes. That is why when we go back here to the housing problem, it reads all the forces in the urban housing market that have led to the shrinking supply of affordable and low-income housing. What forces? These are the forces of the ruling class. Their forces have caused a shrinking supply of affordable and low-income housing. And these forces have been met with or encouraged by failing government housing policies. No matter who you have in office. See, this isn't about... This isn't about this isn't about white or black, Spanish or Chinese. This isn't about ethnic uh, uh, divide. This is about rich against the poor. For example, you had a president in office, Barack Hussein Obama. And ironically enough, Mr. Obama uh, really uh, fooled especially the so-called African-American people in the um, United States of America. But ironically enough, Mr. Obama won the peace, uh, Nobel Peace Prize, and he waged more war than the president previous to him, which was George Bush Jr., you might not know that because the media never told you that. The media kept you occupied in other things. The games. The talk shows. Why am I bringing this up? Because there was a man in whom Obama had killed in Libya. The president of Libya. And his name is Muammar al-Qaddafi. The American media convinced the American people that he was a bad man. He was a bad man. Tyrannical. He must be removed. He must be destroyed. He threatened our liberties today. He threatened us here in America. He is a part of Al-Qaeda. He's a part of ISIS or whatever. The, whatever, the, whatever goons they make up brand in the media and cause us to believe it. Now, why am I bringing up Mr. Muammar Gaddafi, the president of Libya, former president of Libya, who was assassinated and killed by the Americans? Because he wrote a book called The Green Book. And uh, this is what he said in The Green Book. And this is one of the reasons why the Americas and also the capitalist countries, Western Europe 
any other capitalist country, Japan, China, and Russia, all of the capitalist countries of the world needed him to be gone because they, did, they could not afford for his policies to spread. After all, the Americans and the capitalists have done a good job in uh, shooting down and censoring uh, the American media to keep away any kind of knowledge about socialism or communism. Well, Muammar Gaddafi was a socialist. And he understood and seen that there was a housing problem throughout the world. And he argued this. And you will find this in his book if you decide to pick up his book. They even have uh, his book, uh, a PDF online, of the Green Book. And this will be uh, uh, part two. This will be part two in his Green Book or chapter two under need. Need. Now listen, because this is who Obama had killed. Uh, you, you, you have to wonder, when you really begin to read the information, who's really censored? The American people are taught that people of the other countries are censored. They, we are taught that people are, are under tyrannical rule, dictatorships, and they don't have the freedoms and liberties in which we possess. I'm here to tell you, you've been tricked. We've all been tricked. We do not have the liberties you think we have. Okay? We are only allowed and have the liberty to play whatever ball that the capitalists tell us to play with. Any other thing they want to play with outside of what they tell you to play with, off limits to you. And they don't even want you to talk about it. Now, underneath, this is what Muammar Gaddafi said. This is the man in whom the uh, people wouldn't kill. You have military men who trying to, who, you know, a great percentage of men in the military are homeless. And the military uh, personnel was encouraged to go over to Libya and remove this dictator. I'm here to tell you, if the, mil if the military going to move a dictatorship, they need to march right on Washington. And after they finish marching on Washington, they need to march to every district, all the states of the United States, and remove all of the state powers and those rich men who sit in power. This is how you remove the dictatorship. Because we presently sit under a dictatorship and we are lied and we're, we're lied to and we're told that this is a democracy. This is not a democracy. And it's been proven time and time again, it is not a democracy. It's not a government for the people. It's not a government by the people. Okay, period. My first experience when I seen when I was growing up was the presidential, presidential election of Al Gore. I didn't, I didn't know what was going on too much. So, you know, I followed the ways of, uh, 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 of my local union hall. Whoever going to help out the laboring man. Well, the majority of the people voted for Mr. Gore. But the ruling class made sure they got in there who they wanted to get in there. And they also have ways through propaganda. When they have enough time to convince the American public to put in office who they would like to put in office. So they put Mr. Obama, uh, uh, Barack uh, Hussein Obama in office and they used him to do their capitalist bidding to go around the world and try to destroy the countries in whom seek the welfare of the poor and oppressed people of the world. They sent Barack Obama and his goons down to Venezuela for bad intentions. They sent him down to Cuba for, with bad intentions. The same bad intentions that Ronald Reagan had when he decided to go and help dismantle the USSR and whom was helping the poor and oppressed people of the world. But you don't learn this in Hollywood. This is not on TV. Now, Notice what Mr. Muammar Gaddafi said underneath. He says, man's freedom is lacking if somebody else controls what he needs. For need may result in man's enslavement of man. So if another man possesses your need, this can result in your enslavement. And that's what has happened to the American people. We, this is the land of the fees the home of the wage slave. Here it is. 
and we have the few rich men who control what we need. They possess what we need. We must sell the pounds of our flesh just to get what we need. We must sell our flesh for tickets of exchange to get what we need. So our life hang in doubt because it is in the grasp we have given our lives and placed it on the slaughtering board of the rich and they decide whether you eat, they decide whether you have a home, they decide whether you have shelter, they decide it. And that got to change. It's going to change. And that's one good thing about change. Change gonna come. The question is, are you gonna be a part of the change? And those of you who believe the Bible, you know change gonna come. And it's gonna come. And the Bible teaches us that the nations will be angry. But do you think change come all of a sudden? Or the process of change is happening as we speak? Yes, it is happening as we speak. Every action causes a reaction. Now, Mr. Uh, 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 Muammar Gaddafi, he argues that if someone else controls what he, a man needs, uh, this results in a man's enslavement. Needs causes exploitation. So when you control a person's need, this causes for exploitation. So the forces in the urban housing market who have been shrinking the supply of affordable housing, they have been shrinking the supply of what men need, and they are encouraged and met with encouragement by failing government housing policies because the government is a tool of the rich to oppress the poor. Now, what else did Mr. Muammar Gaddafi argue? Need is an intrinsic problem and conflict grows out of the domination of man's needs. So if one man dominates another man's needs, conflict grows, of course. That's why Mr. Lenin and Mr. Marx argued this was the necessity of the state. When you have a small group of people, tyrannical dictators, a club of ruling elite, who take what men need, housing, means of production, the food, the land, the resources, once they take what you need, then they have to organize a state, arm the state, create laws to legalize their plunder and robbery and use this plunder and robbery under the name of the state or in the name of the state to oppress the poor. Mr. Gaddafi, this is the one in whom the Americas had killed now. Mr. Uh, 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 Muammar Gaddafi says, the house is a basic need of both the individual and the family. So this is what he's arguing, the house. And a lot of those soldiers who went up there and helped assassinate Mr. Muammar Gaddafi, who actually was on your behalf, fighting for you poor soldiers, because that's all who's going to fight out of the poor. We were, the soldiers were brainwashed to go kill a man who was on their behalf. And a lot of those soldiers who have come from the wars around the world are homeless. And Mr. Uh, Gaddafi says, the house is a basic need of both the individual and the family. Therefore, it should not be owned by others. There shouldn't be a landlord who owns what you need. You should not have to pay for a right for shelter on the go. It is what you need. So if you don't have money, you don't have tickets of exchange, you mean to tell me now that you're going to lose your needs. And this is what America displayed ever since it's been a, a country. This is what America displayed even before it was America. And this is what the, this is what the mothers of America display. Western Europe and whom America sprang forth from. This is what they've done in Europe. And this is what the 
ruling class throughout the world have done. So I'm not picking on an ethnic group because it's class wars in China or Asia, it's class wars in Europe, it's class wars in Africa, it's class wars in America's North, South, and Central. Class wars. Australia, all over the world because of the ruling class who decide to take what men need. And one of the things in which they possess and which a man needs is a home. And the house is the basic need of both the individual and the family. Therefore, it should not be owned by others. According to Muammar Gaddafi, this is what he's saying. He also adds, there is no freedom for a man who lives in another's house, whether he pays rent or not. All attempts made by various countries to solve the problem of the housing are not solutions at all. So in essence, the affordable housing projects and low income housing projects, they're really not solutions. That's what I said in the beginning of the discussion. They're really not solutions. They could buy time. They can house a few people just to drop in the ocean, but it's not a solution. The reason is that those attempts do not aim at the radical and ultimate solution of man, which is the necessity of his owning his own home. The attempts have concentrated on the reduction or increase of rent and its standardization, whether at public or private expense. In the socialist society, no one including society itself, is allowed to have control over man's needs. No one has the right to build a house additional to his own and that of his heirs for the purpose of renting it because the house represents another person's need and building it for the purpose of rent is an attempt to have control over the need of that man and in need and in need freedom is latent. So this is what he said about housing and he went on a campaign to eradicate to make sure everybody in Libya had housing. We not aware of that because we were told by CNBC and all of the American media that this is a terrible dictator. A terrible dictator who's trying to eradicate or who believe in eradicating the housing problem. Now, he said in a socialist society, in a socialist society, because in a capitalist society, even owning your home is a problem. So therefore, what I'm saying that the capitalist mode of production must be abolished. I want to go back to the social problems. Now, it continues. It says, in practice, what usually happens is, oh, excuse me, let me skip down some. Cities apply for federal funds, and when they receive them, this is, they're giving an example of how government policies have failed. It says, cities apply for federal funds, and when these, and when they receive them, use the legal powers of eminent domain and other powers granted them under both federal and state urban renewal legislation to declare an area blighted. This is the power that the rich have to use the powers of eminent domain in the private sector now. Once so designated or once they consider an area blighted, all structures in the area were eliminated, which we see today this is what we see going on throughout Buffalo. This is what we see going, th going on throughout New York State, Chicago, uh, uh, Detroit, Cleveland, California, all over, all over. Because the American people still don't realize the, the plunder inherent in the capitalist mode of production. We are duped into believing that the state will create laws that will help us, and they not. They never have. Never have. Okay, now once so designated, all structures in the area were eliminated. Often this was done to facilitate the development of large public projects. Notice some of the projects. Colleges or universities, do we see that going up? Wherever you watch this video, on YouTube or you watch it locally, do you see that going up? 
colleges and universities. Nothing, excuse me, nothing for the oppressed more for profits, colleges and universities, medical centers. Do we see this happening? Yes. Or even private commercial projects on the now available land. Look at your housing. Look at your penthouses going up. Look at these old vacant buildings, this old uh, <clears throat> fixed capital turning into uh, uh, capital, uh, 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 um, turning into fixed capital now that can cause circulating capital to go back to it. Penthouses, luxury homes. This is what's happening. But you have people fighting to designate some of the houses for low income. However, all of the people knew, and if you read history, the political scientists and economists understood this is a farce, it is a racket, it's racketeering of the rich, it's just means for them to make money and to keep the poor peas and shut up for a while until they devise new plans to plunder us. So this is not about race. Not about race at all. Now, notice this. The budget cutbacks during the Reagan and Bush administration slashed federal housing funds by 70%. New construction of low-income housing by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is HUD. The federal agency responsible for creation and maintenance of low-income housing in American cities decreased by 90%. Congress and the Clinton administration decreased the HUD budget again in 1995, this time by 25%. And we see further cutbacks that's taking place under, under the, uh, um, what's the uh, new president name, president-elect Donald Trump administration. And we also see slashes and cutbacks under the Obama administration. For the first time, there was no increase in the number of available Section 8 certificates. That's being cut under the uh, Trump administration. Congress and the president also slashed funds for the maintenance and rehabilitation of existing public housing, thereby ensuring its further deterioration. The Republican Congress and President Clinton endorsed these changes in public and subsidized housing at a time when the housing needs of the poorest households in the U.S. cities were at an all-time high. Why? Because the state is a tool or organ used to oppress one class by another. The state is an organ used by the rich because it's the dominant, those who are economic, economically dominant are also those who are politically dominant and they are the ones who use the state to oppress the people. But I'm here to tell you, the people have the power. All the people have to do is stop. A nationwide strike will shut down this whole country. A nationwide strike will shut down the whole country. Get out, get, get the people's attention. People, you have to understand what we're facing. We can overturn it without a gun. However, the Bible teaches us how it will be overturned. The nations will be upset. The question is, though, will you partake in the change? You may not think a change is going to come. They never thought that the change was going to take place when the fall of the Bronze Age took place. And uh, during the time of 1177 B.C., around that era. They never thought Rome would fall, and it did. So what you have to learn to realize is that the forces of nature itself, everything you see will rise and is rising against the oppression of the people. The question is, what side will you all be on? And not only what side will we be on, but what will we do to affect this change? And you have a lot of secular movements. You have secular communists trying to affect the change. You have secular socialists. You have anarchists. You have all these different political activist groups, different political activists, and they're all talking about this change. And you know what? They all have their part to play. All of these groups have their part to play. However, the only successful method at the end, when it all boils down, will be those who take hold on to the biblical form of communism and socialism. Though, what the Bible calls is New Jerusalem. It will not be done without the power of the, of the heavens. And this is, what, this is the element the people are missing. 
That's why the communist movements, for the most part, have always failed. Because when you study the communist literature, what they are describing is a change in the character and the mind of the individual. And those of us who read the Bible begin to realize and understand is that actually the secular communists will be wise if they studied the teachings of Karl Marx and uh, Frederick Engels and Vladimir Lenin um, and realize and consider that these men had a biblical background. They understood Frederick Engels was once a, a Christian until he abandoned the he abandoned the commercial form of Christianity, Christianity. And Karl Marx was familiar with Judaism and Christianity as well. And they actually wrote about the Christian movement and they understood. Even Lenin himself argued that the Christians of today have forgotten about the nature, the true nature of the early Christian movement started by Jesus of Nazareth and the Apostles. Now, I told you I'm going to read, read the Bible into it because I said, what side will we be on? Now, I want to establish this here in the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah and I know people don't read the prophets, but there's nothing new under the sun. So all of the prophets have a message that is uh, definitely up to date and fit our situations. And they also teaches us of how this is going to go down. Now, in Jeremiah the 25th chapter. The prophet Jeremiah was told, Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 15, it says, For thus saith Jehovah, Elohim of Israel, Take this wine cup of wrath from my hand, and make all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. Now, some Bibles, it will have Lord God, some Bibles have Jehovah, some Bibles have Yahweh, and some Bibles have Jehovah. It's just a different name that they give the Almighty. All right. Now, Jehovah said to Jeremiah, take this cup of wrath from my hand and make all nations to drink it. See, we don't, we, we're not taught that God get mad. We're not taught that. But in your own Bible, whatever Bible you have, we read the King James Bible too. One of my favorites. Read it, Jeremiah 15, and you're going to, Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 15, is going to talk about the wrath of God. Now, Jeremiah, Jeremiah was told by God, take this wrath and give it to the nations. Take this wine cup of wrath, figuratively speaking, and have the nations drink it. Verse 16 reads, And they shall drink and shake and go mad because of the sword that I am sending upon them. God promised to drunken the nations. This wrath of fury, his anger upon the world, will cause a consequence of the nations out they dag on mine. The nations out they mine. And they shall go mad because of the war that I am sending among them. Notice, he's going to send war and anger and frustration among the nations. So, them building nuclear bombs, them building weapons of war, threatening one another, wars and rumors of wars. This is a part of the figurative language that Jeremiah is speaking of when he's saying God is causing the nation to drink of his wrath. So everything is going according to plan. But in Western theology, you don't think God has anything to do with this. He got all to do with it. He got all to do with it. Oh no, God don't have nothing to do with this war. He got all to do with it. The prophet Amos said, evil can't come upon the city unless God bring it. And you probably never read that in your life for those of you who are stuck in religion. But we're dealing with politics, world politics. 
Jeremiah was an ambassador that had to go to the parliament in Jerusalem and testify to them. And he is told to be a witness or an ambassador or an activist and give a warning to the nations. That's why he had it written down in the book. And us reading it today, the words of Jeremiah still fills the air. So he said in verse 16, And they shall drink and shake and go mad because of the sword that I am sending among them. I then took the cup from the hand of Jehovah and made all the nations drink to whom Jehovah has sent me, or the Lord has sent me, or to whom God has sent me. All the nations. Let's see how many nations he sent them to. If we skip down to verse 27. Notice, and you shall say to them, Thus said Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim or the God of Israel, Drink, be drunk, and vomit. Fall and rise no more. He's telling the nations, you're going to get drunken. You're going to fall. You're going to be intoxicated. All you nations of the world, you're going to fall and you will not rise anymore. That means all of the oppressive and ruling class. The oppressors who rule the state. The oppressors who use the state to oppress the people. They shall be broken. God has promised to send war among them. Now he says, again in verse 27. And you shall say to them, thus said Jehovah of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, drink and be drunk and vomit. Fall and rise no more because of the sword which I am sending among you. And it shall be when they refuse to take the cup from your hand to drink. Then you shall say to them, thus saith the Lord, or thus saith Jehovah of hosts, you shall drink. King James says you shall surely drink it. You have no choice. You nations, you have no choice. You going down. You are going down presently as we speak your under your demise. Now, it continues. For look, I am bringing, or excuse me, for look. This is what he's telling the nations. And this is what I want us to pay attention to. Look, I am bringing, or excuse me, I am beginning to bring evil upon the city which is called by my name. Now I told you Jeremiah was an ambassador to his own people, the Jews or the Judeans. So God is telling Jeremiah to go tell the nations, tell the nations, look man, I'm pronouncing evil upon my own country. So he said, for look, I am beginning to bring evil upon the city which is called by my name. This was the city of the Jews, the, the, the Judeans, the house of Israel. And the question is, and should you be entirely unpunished? So the prophet was told by God to go to the nations and say, look, God is punishing the city that is called by his name, his own people, for sins. And do you nations think that you're going to go unpunished? From your sins? No. You're going to drink the cup. You understand? And that's what people teach us today. That was all for the Jews. No. You're going to suffer for the same sins. Notice. And we want to identify what these sins are. Would you, have, would you have a clue that these sins got to do with housing? Now, you say, Brother Judah, what you talking about? Yes, it has to do with housing. One of the reasons why God was bringing evil upon his own people because of the rich ruling class plundering and exploiting their people by robbing them of land and housing. Look. For look, I am beginning to bring evil upon the city which is called by my name and should you be entirely unpunished. You are not going to. You are not going unpunished. For I am calling for a sword on all the inhabitants of the earth declares Jehovah of hosts. You see, all the world, all the nations of the world are being brought down 
to drink the wrath of God. And God is bringing war upon them. War upon them. Tumblr shall come to the end of the earth. And Yahuwah has a controversy with the nations. He shall enter into judgment with all flesh. The wrong he will give to the sword, declares Yehovah. You're going to fall by the sword. That's what I'm saying. When we're talking about the kingdom of God, it shall be established on this earth. The nation of the earth is going to be removed. The process is now. The judgment has begun. It is time for us now to organize and rise against the state. God promised to be on our side if we stand for what's right. And all those who oppose what is right, he has promised to give them to destruction, to give them over to the sword. And you may ask, he says, Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, See, evil is going forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind is raised up from the farthest parts of the earth. The wrath of God is going from nation to nation. These nations are going to consume one another. This is what he's talking about. He's going to bring a sword. They're going to consume one another on top of the weather against them, on top of the forces of nature against them. That's why the Bible tells you to go back and remember what he did in Egypt. Moses led a people out of oppression without lifting up a sword. The forces of nature rose against the people. They want to talk about climate change. This is no different than what happened in 1177 BC, the collapse of the Bronze Age. Everything was against it. The climate change, everything was against the wicked. And it just so happened during that same time, God was raising up a government. And this is what you begin to find in the books of Exodus when you put history together. But everything is against it. Everything. The earth is alive. The universe is alive. And the universe will shift on behalf of the oppressed and those who work righteousness or justice. And it's going to shake loose. It's going to turn loose all the oppressors of the world. This process has begun. So when we're talking about the oppression of the people and homelessness, you have to now organize and begin to learn and understand so you can find the right side and know what you need to do today. There is a methodology today that is to be performed, experiments to be performed that the early church did where they made, where they uh, pooled their resources where none was lacking. Had food, shelter, clothing, and administration delivered by the Apostle Saul. To deliver goods and resources down to the afflicted people in the different parts of the country. Those are the teachings. But I am bringing this to our attention now. God said he's bringing a sword. Okay. He's bringing a sword. Because we see the rich. They are using the state to oppress the people. And they are not helping the people with housing. I want to go to Isaiah because you say, brother, well, you talk about the judgment of God. Yes, I wanted to talk about the judgment of God to show us that God said, I, I'm punishing my own country for their evil. Do y'all think y'all going to go unpunished? So in order to find out what God was punishing his own people for, we got to read the prophets. And when we learn why God punished his own people, God looked to the nations and said, do y'all think y'all going to go unpunished for doing the same thing? Just like I will punish and destroy this nation of Israel because of these iniquities and transgressions and plunder, I'm going to do the same thing to you nations. I'm going to send a sword among you nations if you commit the same iniquity. And what was the iniquity? Look at this. Or what was the transgression? Now, Isaiah, the first chapter. Isaiah, chapter 1. Isaiah, chapter 1. Starting for time at verse 16. Isaiah chapter 1 and 16. It reads, Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. 
Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Stop doing evil. Now, what is the evil that they're doing? Let's see. Learn to do good. That's why we open up these classes. That's why we're trying to get classes and people in different parts of the state, in different parts of the country, and even people who listen to us outside of the country. We must learn to do well and therefore must work together to set up classes and schools so we can perform experiments to help aid one another in this process while the kingdom of the wicked, the kingdom of the rich, the imperial powers are coming to, to their demise. It's our job to begin to work for the ways and the establishing of the equity and justice of the kingdom of God. So he said, learn to do good. Seek right ruling or seek justice. Notice this, verse 17, reprove the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. In the Bible, the fatherless and the widow are a figurative of the vulnerable in the society. Verse 18 reads this. Listen, he said, seek justice. Reprove the oppressor. This is what he's telling the people to do. Come now, verse 18, come now. Let us reason together. See, you got to learn how to reprove the oppressor. We have to learn how to do justice. And the creator is saying, come now and let us reason together, says Jehovah. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If we learn to do well, and if we learn to reprove the oppressor, then he will clean us up from our sins. You might not have heard that a lot in modern day theology. Seek justice. Reprove the oppressor. We're talking about social activism among the believers of God. Learning to do well. And verse 19 reads. If you submit and obey, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse, verse 20, and rebel. If you refuse to fight and work against the oppressor. To reprove the oppressor. If you refuse to help the fatherless. To help the vulnerable. If you refuse and rebel. You shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of Jehovah has spoken it. He said you shall be devoured by the sword. This is what he told his own people. Now remember, the creator is sending a sword throughout all the nations of the world because they're not reproving the oppressor. They are oppressing the people. They're not helping the vulnerable of society. They're plundering the vulnerable of society. Just like the Jews were. Just like the Israelites were. And God said, I'll punish the Israelites for that. And I'm going to punish the rest of the world for it. So this housing problem is coming up before the God of heaven. The universal power. This power. Okay. This divine consciousness that created all things. The injustice is come before him. And he said... He's going to send a sword and his wrath throughout all the nations. Right over to Isaiah 5. What were they doing? What were they doing against the vulnerable of society? What were they doing to oppress the people? Notice Isaiah chapter 5. And let's see if this is familiar. Not just in the Jews country, but also in the countries of the world. Under Obama's administration. Under the Bush's administration under Clinton's administration, under the Kennedy's administration, under the uh, Nixon's administration, you name them. Under George Washington administration, it's always been the same. Robbery and plunder of the people. And notice this, and you will especially find this in the foundations of America, the Republic who stole all the land from the people and force the masses of the people to become wage slaves. Now, let's see what Isaiah said. Isaiah, the fifth chapter, 
starting at verse 7, it says, For the vineyard of Jehovah of hosts, or the Lord of hosts, is the house of Israel, and the man of Judah, his pleasant plan. He looked for justice or right ruling, but see oppression. He looking for justice, but don't see nothing but oppression. For righteousness, but he sees weeping. That's right. Oppression brings weeping. You don't have enough food to eat. You can't feed your babies. Bring weeping. You don't have no shelter for your babies. It brings weeping. You don't have homes. You don't have anything. You rob them. Everything. Can't even find decent food or afford decent food because the market and the capitalists have flooded the markets <clears throat> with toxic substances they call food. Adulterated substances they call food. And this is what they've been doing through the ages and to the people. Search for the God of heaven and he lead them out of he found oppression. That's what he's seen. He looked for justice and seen nothing but oppression. And he looked for righteousness, but he seen nothing but weeping. Why? What was going on? Notice this. Notice the transgression that caused the weeping and oppression. Woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field, until there is no room. And you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. Notice. Woe to those who join house to house. Though, woe to the ones who's buying up all the housing. Woe to the ones who's taking violently all the housing. Woe to the ones that's adding land upon land. Field upon field. That they own it all. That... The prophet said, you trying to make it that you're the only ones in the midst of the land? You shove all the poor people into the corner of the earth and you possess all of the land. You don't possess all of the houses. Throw no trespassing signs up and the state legalizes this robbery and plunder. The state makes it legal. But God said, woe to you. I destroyed my people for doing this. Robbing the people of their housing. He said, you joining house to house you taking the people housing. you taking what the people need to live. That's what Muammar Gaddafi was arguing. You cannot take the land and you cannot take people housing or control people's housing and rent housing to people. That is a right a person need to live. But what have the forces of the capitalists have done? By the strength of the state, the state have allowed a few men to take all the houses. The state have allowed a few men to take all of the land. Therefore, we hear cries. Therefore, we hear oppression. God says this in my hearing, Jehovah of hosts said, Truly, many houses shall be a waste. Big and fine houses shall be without inhabitant. In other words, you rich folks, you think through the ages. You haven't learned through the fall of Rome. You haven't learned through the fall of Greece. You haven't learned through the fall of the Bronze Age. You haven't learned that the demise of the rich is constant. You heap up riches and God destroy you. But the Bible preaches. This is the last time this is going to happen though. The last vestiges of the ruling class to heap up riches. Another empire will never rise again. From this time forward. As the nations fall, the rulers of the earth will be the meek. It will be the men and women of justice. They shall inherit the earth and they shall share and distribute the goods and resources in equity and in justice. All you rich, you're coming to your end. And this is what the prophets and the apostles taught. When Jesus of Nazareth ridiculed and blasted at the rich and told them, man, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter to the kingdom of heaven. He went in there and threw over the tables of the rich man who were buying and selling and turned the temple into a bank. The rich man wanted him dead. 
He demanded that the rich rulers take their wealth and give it to the poor. He demanded and he stood in behalf of the poor. And what happened? They delivered him over to the Roman authorities and the state executed Jesus of Nazareth. And many people call themselves followers of Jesus of Nazareth today. Jesus of Nazareth protested against the injustices of the state. And then commanded all those who believe in him to do what he did. Did he say follow me? And then those who followed him, he instructed them and gave them methods on how to help one, help feed one another. You will find this description in Acts the second chapter, starting at verse 44, and Acts the fourth chapter, starting at verse 32. We have other teachings on it. They are robbing the houses. They are taking the fields. This was the sin of Judah. This was the sin of of the house of Israel. And God said, look, by the mouth of Jeremiah in Jeremiah the 25th chapter, he argued, verse 29, chapter 25, for look, I am beginning to bring evil upon the city which is called by my name. And should you be entirely unpunished, you are not going unpunished, for I am calling for a sword on all the inhabitants of the earth, declares Jehovah of hosts. Because he called the sword on his own people. He said, learn to do well, relieve the oppressed, learn to do well. And if you rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Well, this is what he's telling the nations too. The nations, if you rebel against redistributing the resources, Nations, if you rebel and refuse to let the inhabitants of the earth go free from your bondage of wage slavery and tyrannical dictatorship, you will be devoured by the sword because he's sending his wrath and his sword upon all nations. Back in the book, we're going to look at something else here in the scriptures. But back in the book, Social Problems, Social Problems, uh, I want to flip over to page 160. Notice this. Why did he destroy the children of Israel? Because they did social injustice. They were robbing the people and taking the land and the housing. Now, here in the United States, it says in the U.S., public housing has been Public housing has been the housing for the last resort for the poor, of the poor only. No more than a third of U.S. households who qualify for low-income housing assistance get it from the government. That's right, because the government is helping the rich. In some large cities such as Chicago, the figure is barely half that. And only one-fifth of the poor live in government subsidized housing of any kind, be it public housing run by local government, privately owned development subsidized by HUD, or private apartments where tenants pay rent with government vouchers. No federal program has ever reached more than a fraction of the urban households in the United States that need housing assistance. Government expenditures have never provided the decent, safe, and sanitary housing guarantee all Americans by the Housing Act of 1949. They never fulfilled it. And they never intend to fulfill it. They just buy time. They buy time to get a stranglehold over us. Keep us confused so we don't know what's going on. But now it's time for us to learn what's going on. The Bible says, come, let us reason together. We must learn to do well. We must learn what we're living in. Instead of government housing, policy and funds were designed to make the provision of low and moderate income housing profitable for private developers, builders, and landlords. So this 
money by the state was used simply to make the private investors, the developers, the builders and landlords rich, just like Isaiah said. They're buying field to field. They're taking the houses and they are reaping oppression all over the world. And God said, do you think you're going to go and punish for doing this evil? Do you think you're going to go and punish? We're almost out of here. Notice. Consequences of the urban housing crisis. Trends in the urban housing market together with failed housing policies have had and continue to have predictable consequences for a growing number of urban households. One consequence is that more and more households are experiencing a rent squeeze. That's right. A rent squeeze. That's why Muammar Gaddafi argued. He said here in the Green Book, chapter 2, in the Green Book, this is what he said, that, listen, man, what happens under part 2, the solution of the economic problem? He says it's socialism. The Bible actually says the same thing. But we have other teachings on that. You might not believe that, but we can prove it to you. We have debates all over the place about that. And, uh, you know, they can't stand against facts. Period. And the Bible teaches the same thing. In fact, the Bible teaches a more uh, perfect form of uh, biblical communism, which they call New Jerusalem. And people say, but I ain't never heard that before, brother. You're making that up. No, we'll prove it to you. We'll prove it to you. If you want to take time to learn. All right. Now, in part two, because remember, that one of the consequences that more and more households are experiencing a rent squeeze. Now, Mr. Gaddafi said this, man's freedom is lacking if someone else controls what he needs. For need may result in man's enslavement of man. Muammar Gaddafi saying those attempts do not aim at the radical and ultimate solution of man, which is the necessity of his owning his own home. The attempts have concentrated on the reduction or increase of rent and its standardization, whether at public or private expense. In the social society, no one, including the society itself, is allowed to have control over man's needs. No one has the right to build a house additional to his own and that of his heirs for the purpose of renting it because the house represents another person's need. And building it for the purpose of rent is an attempt to have control over the need of that man. And this is who Obama had killed, the man who preached such a thing. Muammar Gaddafi, out of his own book, out of his words, out of his own book in which he attempted in Libya, this is who uh, the Obama administration had assassinated. Now here in America, on the other side of the borders, you don't hear this on CNBC. One consequence is that more and more housing is experiencing a rent squeeze. You will experience a rent squeeze as long as someone else owns your home. And even in capitalism, we even show you even owning a home in capitalism. If your job decides to move because you're a wage slave and you don't bought a house, where that puts you? It still puts you in a jam. Either way, go. Capitalism got to go. Capitalism got to die. Capitalism got to be abolished. This is what God says. And I'm not a religious fanatic. You understand? I don't consider myself religious at all. Religious at all. I believe the Bible. And it's not a religious book. And it has, you know, and it has the answers to the masses of the poor suffering people. But the rich people infiltrated theology. It's the rich person who get up and preach before you. It's the rich preacher who drive off in his car, BMW, Jaguar, and fly off in his jet. Jesus of Nazareth, the poor present prophet, didn't have any of that. And they claim they serve him. Now that's an oxymoron. But those are the teachings. Now look, more than half of all the tenants pay rents that exceed the federal government's definition of affordable housing. 
not more than 30% of housing, not more than 30% of household income. That's what the government said. You shouldn't pay more than 30% of your household income. That's still too damn high. Now, look, when you go to Russia, when Russia overthrew the rich people in 1917, rent did not exceed 4% of the person's income. And it wasn't rent. It was a contribution to the sustainability of the republic. And it was illegal to convict someone. No one had the right to tell you you got to leave. Because housing is a man right. And this is what they did in USSR, the United Socialist Soviet Republic. And that's why Muammar Gaddafi, who also believed in those same principles and policies, tried to implement that in Libya. And not just Libya, he wanted to implement it throughout Africa. So therefore you know the reason why the American imperialists had to go over there and murder them. The American imperialists went over there and murdered the man. And they murdered many men who stood up and said the same thing I'm telling you now. Capitalism got to die in order for the people to be liberated. This is what the Bible teach. Why you think they killed Jesus of Nazareth? Because he said the ruling class got to go and the wealth must be redistributed. That's why they killed Jesus of Nazareth. Now it says, more than one quarter of all renters now devote more than half their income to rent. It's more than that. More than half. More than half. When the demand for low-cost housing exceeds the supply, the cost of low the cost of low-cost rents rises. So too, when gentrification upscales areas that once housed the poor and the near poor. So as the rich move in, and we've talked about gentrification, gentrification don't have anything to do with ethnic, it appears to have something to do with ethnic divide, but it don't. It all has to do with the capitalist mode of production. They must revive. The capitalists must revive capital, fix capital, capital structures and cause money to flow back into it. So it don't matter what color you are. If you got the money, they want you there because you help the economy. But it's the economy that caused the deprivation for the masses. So this whole gentrification thing, people arguing over the wrong thing. Only way gentrification can be solved if capitalism is destroyed. Now, I want to get ready to read something else to you before we close out. This is out of a book by Frederick Engel called The Housing Question. The Housing Question. Yes, The Housing Question. So rent rising, okay? The people struggling to have a place to live. Now, back in the Bible, I want to now go to the prophet Micah. The prophet Micah. In the Bible, we go to the prophet Micah. Because it still stands. The prophets are condemning the nation of Israel because of the oppression of the people. Jeremiah said, God will also judge the world for the same sins of oppressing the people. And we don't have to look far to see that the people are surely, surely, surely oppressed. Now in Micah, the second chapter, Micah, the second chapter, it teaches us in Micah chapter 2, starting at verse 1, notice this. Woe to those plotting wickedness and working out evil upon their beds. That means you got cats and senators and rich men laying down dreaming on how they're going to plunder the poor people. Get up in the middle of the damn night. Go down on Capitol Hill. You may get a little bit of film footage off C-SPAN and passing bills at 1, 2, 3 a.m. at night. We ain't even got to be there. We ain't even got to be there that day. We ain't got to know nothing about it. We get it when they send it down the pipe. Why? Because the state isn't here to help us. The state is simply here as a tool or an organ to 
oppress one class by another. And those who are economically dominant are the same who are politically dominant. And this is who Micah is making reference to. The politically dominant. This is who Jeremiah and the prophets were sent to. The kings, the sovereigns, the ruling class. Now Micah And just to prove it to you, if you read Micah 1 and verse 1, it says, The word of Yahuwah came to Micah in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, sovereigns of Judah. These were the kings and rulers Micah is sent to. Jeremiah and Isaiah were all sent to the rulers. Jesus of Nazareth went to the rulers. Paul of Tarsus went to the rulers. And we up here arguing at the prostitute. We up here arguing. We need to find out what kind of society uh, drew the women into the streets to commit prostitution. We need to find out what kind of society and those in government office created or allowed a society to come into existence that exploit the people to such extent that you got these people out here selling drugs and, and peddling and destroying one another. We need to look at the root cause of the problem. And that's what Micah did. And, he, and the root cause sent him right down to the state government. And Micah says in verse 1, Woe to those plotting wickedness and working evil or working out evil upon their beds. In the light of the morning they practice it because it is in the might of their hand. They can do this evil because they have the power. They have the power of the state. The state <clears throat> is what they use to possess this power that they think about robbing the people. They use the state to do it. And this is why he argued. The, the state, it says as a rule. The state of the most powerful, economically dominant class, which through the medium of the state becomes also the politically dominant class, and thus acquire new means of holding down and exploiting the oppressed class. According to Karl Marx, this is page 9, I just actually read page 14, this is page 9 out of the State and Revolution. According to Marx, the state is an organ of class rule, an organ of, for, for the oppression of one class by another. It is the creation of, quote, order, which, notice this, legalizes and perpetuates this oppression by moderating the conflict between the classes. So it is the state that legalizes this oppression. So those ruling elite who plot wickedness upon their beds and in the morning they get up bright and early to practice it. Get up bright and early, get down to Capitol Hill to pass a bill to rob us some more. Because Micah said it's in their hand to do it. Now again, Jeremiah said if God is punishing his people for doing this, the nations is going to have a sword sent upon them for doing the same thing. Are the nations doing the same thing? Yes. Is there a sword among the nations? Are the nations going mad? Absolutely. Look at them. They're destroying everything and ready to blow up the damn planet because they are so intoxicated and out their mind. And the inhabitants are drunk too. That's why the Bible speaks of repentance. Nothing mystical per se, like you hear in theology, but it means the renewing of the mind. Wake up. Wake up and become aware, conscious, and realize what's happening around you, like Micah did. Verse 2 reads, and they covet fields and seize them. Isaiah said the same thing. They've taken all the fields. These people, whoa, verse 1 again, chapter 2 of Micah. 
Woe to those plotting wickedness and working out evil upon their beds. What in the world was they thinking on, on laying in their bed? In the light of the morning they practice it because it's in their might of their hand. Because it's in the might of their hand. Well, what were they thinking about laying upon their bed? Well, Micah explains it. And they coveted fields. While they was laying upon their bed, they were coveting the land. And seized them. Also houses. Wait a minute. The prophet Micah said the same thing. The wicked laying upon their beds thinking about how they can take all of the land and all of the houses. And they got the power to do it. They got the state power that allows them to do it. So all of the state funding that's supposed to go help the poor people where do the money go? It goes into the builders, private investors. It goes into uh, 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 corporations, landlords. It don't go to the people. It goes right to those who cover the fields. It goes right to those who seize the land and the houses. Like the rich people want to take the land down here in the, in the, in the city of Buffalo, in the fruit boat area, in all of the different so-called dilapidated areas, post-industrial areas, they want the land. They covered in the houses and the lands and the fields. And what they doing with the poor people? They didn't give a house to one or two of them if the people argue enough. But we're saying they got to turn it all loose. Why am I saying it? Because that's what the Bible teach. And the people got to learn to understand that you know what? We have power to bring this to pass. God doing his part. And he's going to take on that. He's going. He's doing his part now. He's calling us to come on board. To begin to partake in this process. Of the overthrow of the rich. Exploiters. And oppressors. Stop being their friends. Stop being entertained by them. And not understanding what's going on. Learn to do well. This is what the prophet said. Verse 2, and they covered how they covered fields and seized them, also houses they seized, and took them away. And they oppressed a man and his household, or his house, a man and his inheritance. So the consequence of taking fields or the land and taking the houses, the consequence is oppression. Just like Isaiah said in Isaiah the fifth chapter. That is the consequence. Let's go look at the procedure. This, this went on way before Isaiah. Let's go to the book of Job. The book of Job. And we're going to read another historical account and we're going to close out for today's second. We're putting this out here so you can understand that the state not going to help you. You have to come back to the Holy Scriptures and learn what we need to do. I'm not calling you we're not calling you to religion. We're calling you to the redemptive struggle of man. Man. To inherit the kingdom of God will be, which will be on this earth. You got to learn how to do this. Job chapter 24. Remember Micah said that they covet houses and they covet fields. And it's in their power to take them. Job talk about the same process centuries before. Before Micah. Before Isaiah. This is an ongoing process. Job chapter 24 and 1. It reads, Times are not hidden from the Almighty. And why have not those who know him seen his days? They remove landmarks. They rob and feed on flocks. Those who remove landmarks. Landmarks are the boundaries of people's lands. The man who removed the landmark is the one who's taking your land. They rob and feed on flocks. They're taking your land and they're taking your cattle or your means of production. We have been through this chapter before for those of you who are familiar with our teachings. They drive away the donkey from the fatherless. They take the widow's ox as a pledge. Her means of production, they have taken her means of production as collateral. Verse 4 reads, they turn the needy out of the way. The poor of the earth have hidden together. Why? Because the rich are taking all the houses and the land. 
and they pushing to pour off. They have hidden themselves together in the inner cities or the ghettos. This is old. See, as wild donkeys in the wilderness, they go out to their tasks. Everybody getting up, going to work. Eager seekers for prey. The desert gives his bread for the children. They reap his fodder in the field and they glean the vineyard of the wicked or the wrongdoer. They spend the night naked though. They're going out to labor. There's food around. They're working in the fields of the wrong or those who do evil. But yet they spend the night in nakedness without clothing or a garment and without covering in the cold. Well, wait a minute now. They done lost their land. They done lost their flocks. They done lost their means of production. They going out to work in the vineyards of the wicked. But yet they naked. How in the world are you working but you're naked? How are you working but you don't have no shelter? Notice verse 8. They are wet with the showers of the hills and have embraced the rock for lack of shelter. You working but you don't have shelter. Isn't that something? Isn't that what you see today among the nations of the world? God said. He punished his people for doing the same thing. Job and his companions said God will punish the people and the rulers of the world for doing it. Oppressing the people. Robbing them of their need. They are embracing the rock for a want of shelter. Verse 14 read, Job called these people the murderers. The murderer rises in the, at daylight. He kills the poor and needy. And in the night he is as a thief. He, Micah said he laying upon his bed thinking about he's covered in fields and houses. And if he got to kill the poor and needy to do it, Job said he'd do it. And in the night he's as a thief. At night they pass him bills to rob us on Capitol Hill. At night they hold him meetings to rob and plunder the people. Because Micah said it's in their power to do it. Job says, In the dark he is at in the dark he has broken into houses. By day they shut themselves up. They know not the light. Meaning the light of righteousness. They have stolen. Just like a thief break into a person's house. Coveted the houses. Coveted the fields. <clears throat> This solution will not be solved until there is a total abolition of the present day system. This is a problem God said he's going to address. Why are the people homeless? Why don't the people have shelter? It's because the rich, according to Isaiah, according to Micah, and according to Job. Out of the mouth of three or more witnesses, let every word be established. They all declare because the rich taken all the property. And since the rich have taken all the property, Lenin and Marx argue it is they who dominate, the economically dominant, they dominate also politically. And the state belongs to them and they use the state as an instrument to oppress the masses of the people. Now, finishing off with the housing question. I was going to read it earlier, but I got distracted. But finishing off with the housing question, page 25, Mr. Ingalls says this. This is by Friedrich Ingalls. He says, part one, under Proudhon, solves the housing question. Here he's arguing with other um, philosophers, if you will, economic philosophers or political scientists who feel that they got the solution to the housing problem. Ingalls said they don't have the solution to the housing problem because they're never talking about doing away with the condition that causes the housing problem. And this is what Lenin argued, and this is also what Muammar Gaddafi argued in the Green Book. So we're going through stages of time. Ingalls was before Lenin. Lenin was before Muammar Gaddafi. The prophets was before all of them. Job was before Micah and Isaiah. 
It is an ongoing struggle that the Bible says that God will resolve. However, part one, it reads, the so-called housing shortage, which plays such a great role in the press nowadays, and this is 1874. Okay, this is in the late 1880s. So even in the late 1880s, there was a problem in Europe. The so-called housing shortage replaced, which plays such a great role in the press nowadays, notice this, does not consist in the fact that the working class generally lives in bad, overcrowded, and unhealthy dwellings. This shortage is not something peculiar to the present. Engel saying this is old. This is not even new in his day. On the contrary, all oppressed classes in all periods suffered more or less uniformly from it. They all suffered from this housing problem. In order to make an end of this housing shortage, he's going to explain what he means by housing shortage. It's not really a shortage. He just said, he's arguing it's a shortage because there's too many people homeless. Notice how he's explaining this. In order to make an end of this housing shortage, there is only one means to abolish altogether the exploitation and oppression of the working class by the ruling class. I'll read it again. In order to make an end of this housing problem or this housing shortage, there is only one means, only one, not two, not three, not four. It's only one. And that is to abolish altogether the exploitation and oppression of the working class by the ruling class. What is meant today by housing shortage is the peculiar intensification of the bad housing conditions of the workers. A colossal increase in rents, a still further aggravation of overcrowding in individual houses, and for some, the impossibility of finding a place to live in at all. This is what he mean by the housing shortage. And it can only be remedied by the abolition or the abolishing altogether, the exp excuse me, it can only be remedied. He said there's only one means, that is to abolish altogether the exploitation and oppression of the working class by the ruling class. This is actually what the Bible teaches. That's why God is talking about abolishing the ruling class because he told us by the mouth of the prophet Jeremiah and the pen of Jeremiah that he's sending a sword through the land and he's bringing judgment and he's going to consume the people out of the land, the rich out of the land and he said they're going to fall and they shall not rise anymore. This is what he said in the book of Jeremiah the 25th chapter just for the record what Ingalls is declaring is the biblical truth. This is biblical truth that is being said by this man who they even would attempt to call an atheist. The prophet Jeremiah teaches us in Jeremiah 25. For look, I am beginning to bring evil upon the city which is called by my name. And we read about that. They've taken all the land, they've taken all of the houses, and they are oppressing the people. So God is bringing evil upon them for that. And he's asking, and should you be entirely unpunished? Speaking to the nations. You are not going unpunished. For I am calling for a sword on all the inhabitants of the earth, declares Jehovah of hosts. And you shall prophesy against them all these words and say to them, Yehoah ro roars from on high, or the Lord roars from on high, and utters his, his voice from his set-apart dwelling place. He roars mightily over his fold, a shout as those who tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. 
Tumblr shall come to the ends of the earth for Yehoah has a controversy with the nations, he shall enter into judgment with all flesh. And the wrongdoers or those who do wrong, he shall give to the sword. So this is speaking of the abolition of the ruling class because of the oppression they're causing in the earth. Now, Mr. Ingalls continues, page 44, I want to show you as he says there's only one solution and he says it again on page 44, but one thing is certain, there are already in existence sufficient buildings for dwellings in the big towns to remedy immediately any real housing shortage. In other words, there's plenty of property, there's plenty of land to fix this problem. That's what Isaiah was explaining and Micah. But it's the rich men who's taking all of the land and houses. It's plenty land and plenty land. It's plentiful houses, but the rich take it. And that's what he's saying. One thing is certain, there are already in existence sufficient buildings for dwellings in the big towns to remedy immediately any real housing shortage. Giving rational utilization of them. This can naturally only take place by the expropriation or the removal of the present owners by the quartering of their housing or their houses to the homeless or those workers excessively overcrowded in their former houses. So take the property, expropriate the present owners by giving the housing to the homeless and those who live in overcrowded dwellings. That's the only way you can do it. You must remove the ruling class. People say, well, man, look at here. We don't want to hear that. But it's Bible. Page 57, we're almost out of here. Whence then comes the housing shortage? In other words, why do we have this housing problem? How did it arise? Well, it is a necessary product of the bourgeois social order. In other words, a housing problem is, ne is a necessary product of, social, of, of the social order of the capitalists. That it cannot fail to be present in a society in which the great masses of the workers are exclusively dependent upon wages. In other words, this problem will always exist in a society in which the rich rule over the poor. Now, he says also this. And on the other hand, drive large masses of the workers temporarily unemployed into the streets. In such a society, the housing shortage is no accident. The housing shortage is no accident. That's why we read in social problems that all of the, the stipends and the grants that's used to help the poor people it's siphoned off to the developers. It's siphoned off to the builders and the landlords. They're not trying to eradicate this, the uh, problem of homelessness. In such a society, the housing shortage is no accident. It is a necessary institution and it can be abolished together with all its effects on health, etc. Only if the whole social order from which it springs is fundamentally refashioned. Capitalism got the goal. This is what the Bible teach. God is calling for a sword upon the land. Now it's time for the people to learn to do well, to understand what you're facing. Those of you who are interested in our classes or who's interested in setting up a class and a study uh, group in your respective areas, Give us a call so we can work together and organize because this work must go out. We must learn to do well and learn what we need to do to move forward this abolition of the destruction of the ruling elite and this capitalist mode of production. With that, we're going to close out into our next segment. Thank you for tuning in. Until the next time, shalom and blessings to all of you who are searching for truth. Thank you.